Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another great conversation with a person who doesn't really need introduction anymore. Uh, but I will introduce him because he deserves to be introduced. And this is Mr. Scott Ritter, a former U.S. Marine Corps intelligence officer and the weapon inspector under United Nations um, in Iraq. Scott, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me for chat number four. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. So today, uh, of course, we will talk a little bit about Ukraine. But I want to start with something different, and that is, I came across a chart that was showing the military personnel power in NATO. And on that chart, US was number one, Turkey, actually Turkey now, they want to be called Turkey, so let's respect that, number two, France, three, Germany, Italy, UK, and Spain. That was the order. So I was pretty, surprised well I, I don't know much about military but turkey is actually number two on that chart and now looking at the events of the situation with turkey and um, finland sweden and the close relationship turkey with russia i have this question to you is there any way that if turkey if turkey doesn't allow Finland and Sweden to be in NATO, that NATO can kick out Turkey out of that organization. And if that is possible, because I came across information, some countries withdrew themselves, like France in 1963, Greece in 1964, but they were not kicked out, like they decided to withdraw from NATO. But can they actually kick Turkey? out and if they do that what this will mean to the rest of the world well they cannot kick turkey out um once a member of nato you are a member of nato until you decide to opt out um and if you take a look um for instance when greece withdrew uh they came back in 1980 but they only came back after unanimous consent um you know, NATO is a consensus-driven organization, and uh, its decisions require unanimous consent, which is why uh, Turkey will be able to prevent uh, Finland and Sweden uh, from uh, joining during this the, the upcoming uh, NATO summit. Um, you know, every every NATO member has a de facto veto over these things. Um, normally, in the interests of um, of preserving, um, you know. The, the integrity of the of, of NATO as an institution, nations like to uh, have a unanimous approach, and so there's a lot of compromises made, etc. Turkey's done. Or Turkey A has done compromising. Uh, they've comp they believe that they've compromised enough uh, with NATO on the issue of terrorism, and uh, they refuse to allow two European nations uh, into NATO who are extremely disrespectful of Turkey's position vis-a-vis -vis, um, the PKK, the Turkish or the Kurdish uh, People's Party uh, and the YPG, which is the uh, Syrian affiliate of the PKK, uh, both of which are designated as terrorist organizations by Turkey. Indeed, the PKK is designated as a terrorist organization by the United States. And the United States knows that the YPG is uh, an offshoot of the PKK. And yet we are closely allied with the I YPG in Syria in our ongoing fight against uh, ISIS. And Turkey is just fed up. They've had it up to here with what they view uh, the hypocrisy of the West. And um, they they claim they made a mistake in 1980, uh, giving in to pressure to allow Greece to return. Uh, Turkey does not have, Turkey A does not have good relations with Greece. In fact, um, if you've ever been to the Turkish I don't know how you would say Turkish border. I'm not making fun. It's, it's <laughs> no, Turkish. I know. <laughs> um, uh, first of all, Turkey is, is simply the Turkish way of pronouncing the word. Um, you know, Turkey is a, is a westernized thing. And I think uh, the, the Turks are, are done uh, playing the Western game. Um, they, they allowed Greece back in. But if you go to the border between those two nations, um, it, it's a militarized border uh, with fence, soldiers patrolling, spotlights, machine gun nests. Um, these oh, are not no. two peaceful neighbors. Uh, Turkey 
despises Greece, and I believe Greece despises Turkey. And they're, if it weren't for their NATO membership, these two nations would have been at war a long time ago. And there's a real prospect that there will be war in the near future because they don't get along. So um, Turkey said, we made that mistake with Greece. We are never going to make that mistake again. And that the only way Finland and Sweden uh, will ever get the Turkish vote to join is if they do a complete 180 degree uh, turnaround when it comes to uh, their relationship with, uh, with the Kurds, with the PKK, with the YPG. And so far, Finland and Sweden have said, no, that's, that's not what, that, that they're not going to do that. So um, unless something dramatic happens, I believe that there's absolutely zero chance that Finland and Sweden will be allowed in the NATO this summer. And you know what? Thank you, Turkey. Thank you. You just saved the world from a war. Um, you know, I think you and I had a conversation earlier about uh, Marie Le Pen. And mm -hmm. uh, I said uh, that I supported her candidacy, not because I agree with anything she stands for, but because she said she would put a break on this expansion of NATO. And I believe that um, that, that was the greater good, stopping this mad rush to allow Finland and Sweden into NATO uh, would be worth whatever domestic price France had to pay for electing Marie Le Pen as their president. Um, she didn't get elected, uh, but Turkey now has stepped into the role as uh, Europe, Europe's savior. Europe doesn't recognize it yet. Someday in the future, Europe will recognize that Turkey, uh, by, by making a stand on principle, um, is, is not only defending Turkey's, uh, Turkey's um, you know, national security interests, but they are saving Europe from self-destruction, from suicide. Because had Finland and Sweden joined this summer, um, I have every reason to believe that Russia would be at war with them before summer is over. So yes. thank you. Thank you, Scott. I have to say to you that when I'm watching this and I feel like Turkey is strategically choosing what is truly the best for them as well, aligning with that part of the world that is actually going to create something sustainable, not destructive. That's how I see it. And when I look at this situation with Finland and Sweden, I just came across this um, information that was actually on Alex Christoforo channel. He mentioned that the deputy secretary made a statement uh, about that they cannot guarantee to Russia that Finland and Sweden will not be um, having nuclear weapons. Like they cannot promise this. So what, what they really expect? <laughs> That's my no, question. Is, look, NATO is, um, I mean, first of all, NATO, it, the continued existence of NATO is a threat to international peace and security. There literally is no justifiable reason for NATO to exist today, none whatsoever. Um, and you know, let, let's let's look at the the incomprehensible reality that is NATO. There's not a single nation in NATO that would have supported Ukraine's membership prior to the Russian uh, military intervention. Not a single one. Ukraine is corrupt. Ukraine is uh, is 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 run through and through with uh, odious right wing neo Nazi ideology. Um, Ukraine has existing uh, territorial disputes, uh, which are in and of themselves um, you know, block the potential of membership. Every single NATO member knew this knew this, knew this, that Ukraine would never be a member ever. They talked about in 10 years and 20, never. You would have to reinvent Ukraine from the ground up before it could become a NATO member. And yet in the interests of you know, NATO integrity, they said, we have an open door policy and we could never deny a sovereign nation's right to be considered as a NATO member. So NATO made possible the Russian intervention. All NATO had to do 
is speak the truth and say no. No, this will not happen ever. And we're happy to give you, Russia, written guarantees. But NATO would not do that because NATO believes it is somehow imbued by a higher authority to do whatever it wants to do, whenever it wants to do it. Um, and so now we take a look at Finland and Sweden. The only adult in the room when it comes to Europe is Vladimir Putin. And Putin has said, look, you guys are sovereign nations. If you want to join NATO, that alone will not cause me to go to war with you. It's your right. You have the right to do this. Um, I won't like it. Russia won't like it. And there will be a price to pay, meaning that the day of us having good relations is over because you're joining a hostile organization. But simply joining NATO isn't a causes belli. We're, we're not going to go to war. However, if you allow NATO infrastructure on your soil, that changes everything. If you invite NATO to come on your soil, you now represent an existential threat that will have to be dealt with. Now, NATO could solve all this by saying, oh, no, 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 we, we, we promise we'll enter into a written agreement with Russia never to put um, a for our, our, our troops on Finnish soil unless they're first attacked by you. If you attack Finland, then we will come and defend them. But if we, as long as you remain in peace, we will not put NATO infrastructure on Finland. We will allow the Finnish military to be built up to the level necessary to defend itself, but nothing more. You won't have French troops. You won't have American troops. You won't have anything like that. You could, you could uh, stop a war by doing that. NATO won't do that. And now the insanity of NATO saying, we can't promise that there won't be nuclear weapons. Yes, you can, NATO. Literally, you can promise this. You can sit down right now and say, we will never allow nuclear weapons to de be deployed on either Finnish or Swedish soil in times of peace. Again, if we go to war against Russia, all bets are off. We can deploy whatever we want because we're at war. But we can, we can sign a, an agreement and we can enter into uh, methods of verification so that Russia can be certain that no nuclear weapons are there. Um, you know, and the beauty of it is if NATO is smart, which they're not, um, they could actually turn to Russia and say, even though Finland and, and Sweden are joining NATO, we would like to preserve the nuclear free zone in the Baltics that, that is currently uh, enjoyed. And so what we would like to do is set up a program of um, reciprocal inspections. So you can come to Finland and Sweden to make sure we haven't deployed nuclear weapons, and we get to go to your bases mm -hmm. of concern and make sure you haven't deployed nuclear weapons. And that can become the, the basis of you know, cooperation, confidence building, peace on earth, goodwill to men, whatever you want. But NATO is stupid, literally the dumbest organization on the face of the planet. The hubris and arrogance that's resident inside NATO is beyond a comprehension. And they won't do that. Instead, they're going to embark on, you know, politically pleasing tough guy stance. Oh, we can't promise. It's a suicide pact. I can guarantee you this. If Finland and Sweden join NATO and NATO says we can't guarantee nuclear weapons will not be on their soil, Russia will assume they're on their soil and Russia will destroy Finland and Sweden before it even gets off the cart. I mean, what part of, you know, Russia warned Ukraine not to go down this path, people not understand. Look what's happening to Ukraine. This could have been stopped by NATO, by Ukraine at any time by stopping playing stupid word games. Russia doesn't play word games. Russia plays reality. And the reality is if Finland and Sweden want to act in a manner which is deemed to be a threat to Russian national security, then they will pay the price. And again, I come back. Thank you. Thank you saving us from this nightmare because nato can't save itself nato is literally the greatest threat to peace and security in europe and i would say indeed the world today it's an organization that has no legitimate reason for continuing to exist other than to promote war 
And that's what it does. It promotes war. Thank you, Scott. I want to share something with you on this. And I want to, this might be a little bit off, but I want to express it with you here. So the summit that um, Erdogan will be attending with this decision, right? This is like before the end of the June, I believe. Yep, 29th and 30th, I believe. Yes, interesting how the end of this month is very uh, significant because also Putin will be announcing uh, what is next with ruble. So there is a lot of a lot of important things happening. But I want to tell you something. I came across this information lately and uh, across comments from someone who has incredible insights and a great channel. On the 15th of June, they are going to release from jail in United States, John Hinckley, the one who was trying to kill Ronald Reagan. This will be complete release from jail. And she mentioned that this is quite interesting in this time frame right now, because as she thought, there might be attempts to remove Erdogan because he stands on the way, right? This is very serious situation right now with this. Uh, like you said, thank you, Turkey, because this is very big opposition. Um, I, how you feel about, I mean, I'm not asking how you feel if they are going to do it, but do you think they will try to do anything possible to make what they want, as far as NATO, I'm talking, to happen. Any opposition to remove along the way? Well, first of all, I would say that uh, from my perspective, um, the relationship between Hinckley and Turkey is purely circumstantial. Uh, his, his release is part of a uh, very long and laborious um, uh, parole process that's been going on for years now. And the timing of this was, was you know, made a long, a, a long time ago. Um, so I, I, I don't see the linkage. Uh, maybe your, 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 your contact has more information that would, would do that. But on Turkey, let's never forget, you know, perception creates its own reality. And from the Turkish perception, the uh, July coup in 2016 was a US NATO backed coup against Erdogan. Now, the US and NATO will say, no, we had nothing to do with it, et cetera. Well, the Turks believe that the U.S. and NATO had something to do with it, that, that this was a Western-backed coup uh, against uh, Erdogan. Um, and the, you know, the, 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 there's, you know, the Gul organization, um, the, and, and Turkey's been rounding up, the, 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 the founder is in Pennsylvania today. Uh, Turkey's been asking for him to be extradited back. The United States protects him. Again, the reality may be that there is no U.S. connection, but from the Turkish perspective, the perception is that the U.S. and NATO have already tried to kill Aragon. Remember, there was a Turkish Air Force com commando team um, prowling the streets of um, the, uh, there's a, a, a Turkish um, um, a resort town whose name escapes me right now, but uh, where, where Aragon was vacationing. Um, and had they arrived minutes sooner, they would have killed Aragon. They would have killed him. That was their task. Um, they failed to do so, and Erdogan survived, but it wasn't from a lack of trying. There was a concerted effort to kill Erdogan, uh, and Erdogan and his government believes that the United States and NATO were involved. Um, hmm. So let, let's put it this way. Um, one, if the Turkish position is, is indeed accurate, we know they've tried in the past. <laughs> so... Um, you know, we therefore we cannot automatically discount they will try again. I don't believe they would be foolish enough to do anything like that um, in Spain. Spain would be insane to allow something like that to take place on their soil. Uh, Spain has the duty and responsibility to provide protection for everybody who arrives. And NATO, it would be the end of NATO. NATO is not a unified organization. It's not just Turkey that is... Um, you know, is, is running afoul of uh, young Stoltenberg's, uh, you know, vision of what NATO should be. Hungary is not playing ball. Italy's not playing ball. Uh, other nations are unhappy. Germany is in France or both. 
not happy with the direction things are going. Uh, they've allowed the three Baltic nations in Poland to hijack NATO's agenda and send NATO tumbling down this suicidal path towards war with Russia. Um, and Turkey is just not going to play ball. They're not going to be part of it. They've said so. Uh, other nations are also not happy. Um, but Turkey's the only one that's had the courage to, uh, and, and in some extent, hungry, yeah. to, to step back and say, no, we're not playing this game. Um, now, if you want to guarantee the demise of NATO, do something that would cause Turkey to leave NATO. Believe me, mm -hmm. there's, there's many people who say, um, you know, we, while we can't kick Turkey out, Turkey out, we can make it so difficult for Turkey to be a member of NATO that they'll w voluntarily withdraw. Um, but wiser heads have said, the moment that happens, NATO as an organization is finished, finished. When we lose the second largest army in NATO uh, after the United States, we're over as a military organization. We have no credibility. We've immediately lost our uh, entree into the Middle East and, uh, and, 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 and the world. Um, Turkey is the bridge between Europe and Asia. Uh, right now, that bridge is part of NATO. If you lose that bridge, you've lost connectivity, um, and NATO is finished. Because the, the moment NATO focused solely on issues relating to European security is when NATO falls apart, because there is no European security. Uh, you know, Croatia has been saying all along, <laughs> before we talk about getting entangled in Ukraine, why don't we make sure we take care of the Balkans first? Uh, Croatia is looking nervously at Kosovo, nervously at Serbia, nervously at Bosnia, where the Bosnian Serbs are making noise, and recognizing the reality that there could be another major conflict in the center of Europe, in the Balkans, um, that would absolutely rip Europe apart. Um, and so why would Europe stop focusing on resolving this unfinished business and get involved in this new business in Ukraine with the potential of expanding the conflict in the Moldova, Poland, mm -hmm. Romania, um, Finland, Sweden. Uh, so there is no unity. Um, and if Turkey withdraws, I think that could be the beginning of a general fracturing of NATO. So I think the opposite is going to take place in Madrid. I think Erdogan is going to be welcomed with open arms. I think they're going to try and mitigate or minimize the uh, perception of a break between Turkey and NATO. I think NATO is going to say that the uh, it was not the right time for Finland and Sweden to, uh, mm -hmm. to join, uh, but we welcome their applications and we will consider them down the road. Um, you know, so this is a deviation from the fast track that Finland and Sweden were hoping for. But I think you're going to see NATO spinning uh, the events so that it, it, it comes out, you know, to create the perception of unity, that, tur that Turkey may not allow Finland and Sweden now, but Turkey is not opposed to the eventual membership and expansion of NATO. And of course, all glory be to NATO and the expanding nature of this wonderful organization. And we look forward to a time when we can all be united under the single banner of NATO. I mean, this kind of ridiculous, dogmatic, theocratic nonsense that, that is NATO. Um, you know, I think that's what they're going to do, as opposed to highlighting the division. NATO is not in the business of telling the truth about anything. And if they were going to tell the truth about the division, then people would wake up and say, well, wait a minute, what about all this unity that Biden's been talking about, Jan Stoltenberg's been talking about? It appears there is no unity. That's the truth of NATO. There is no unity. Uh, no, they want to create the perception of unity. So they're going to do everything they can to welcome Turkey in there and create a platform that makes it appear that Turkey is united with the other members of NATO towards a great NATO-centric future. So how, how you see this in the future, Scott, because we've spoken about this actually during our first conversation, that the clock is ticking, the time is running out, and sooner or later, NATO will stop to exist, right? How do you see the world, how the world looks like without NATO 
in in your eyes how you see this how is this um well the first bala thing is, balanced the first thing i think is that um the reality of uh, of of the dysfunctional nature of europe will will come out i mean right now europe is a dysfunctional continent if you think that the european people are all united in a single vision of what europe is and, and all that mm -hmm. you're you're I want to know what you're smoking because I don't smoke marijuana, but I will now because apparently it's really good stuff. It makes you have visions. Um, Europe is dysfunctional. Um, they don't like each other. And there's reasons for this, centuries old reasons that have been papered over by concepts such as the European Union, the European Council, NATO. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, Hungarians hate Poles. Poles hate Hungarians. Hungarians hate Ukrainians. Ukrainians hate Poles. Germans hate French. French hate everybody. I mean, this is the reality of, of Europe. I'm a little exaggerating here, but it's there. They don't get along. There's uh, centuries old uh, divisions. Um, and that doesn't mean that Europe can't live in peace. I hope Europe can live in peace. But Europe won't live in peace if you don't address these, these issues and, and, and to pretend that just because you created a single currency, you've now created a single people is the greatest deception of all. Uh, there is no singularity, uh, homogeneous nature of Europe. It's a very fractured continent. And I think um, when NATO collapses, as it will, you'll see Europe immediately uh, you know, and this is one of the things that, you know, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, say what you want about him, at least he's one European leader who at least thinks like a European, whether you support that or not. He recognizes the poison that is NATO. He has said NATO is not the direction we need to be heading, that we need to be thinking of a European security infrastructure where Europe comes together free of this insane driving force by the United States to promote war with everybody. We don't need to be at war with anybody. That's Macron's feeling. Um, he doesn't want Europe to become a battleground between the United States and Russia, between the United States and China. Uh, and yet that's exactly what's happening. Macron wants to have a unified Europe. It's unrealistic. I, I don't think it's, it's doable, but at least he's thinking in terms of the necessity for a unified European uh, framework, but nobody else is moving in that direction. And when Poland, or when uh, when when Europe, when NATO collapses, I think you're going to see Europe collapse. Um, I think Germany and France will try to retain some sort of relationship. They've been working on that for years now. I think they both recognize that there doesn't need to be yet another German-French war. Um, uh, France, I think, understands that they again would lose that war. Um, you know, I mean. That's the scary thing is that Germany, I mean, one of the greatest mistakes the world has ever made is allowing German reunification without appropriate checks and balances, because we're seeing the, the, the consequences of that today. We're seeing a remilitarized Germany, $100 billion or euros to rebuild their military. We're seeing an aggressive um, eastward looking focus. When do we ever want Germany looking eastward? Never. We never want Germany to look eastward. Because when they look eastward, they get funny thoughts in their heads and they start goose stepping. We're seeing that happen right now as Germany starting to feel its oats and say, yeah, we're going to rebuild. We're going to be the military, the strength of Europe standing up against Russia. Well, let me remind Germany politely, you lose every time you fight Russia and you lose badly. And you will lose again. But the mistake was made to reunify Germany without appropriate checks and balances. And now we have a problem in, on our hands. We also have a problem with the Baltic states and Poland. Um, they won't be happy. If, if NATO goes away, they'll feel very weak, uh, very threatened. They will unify as a, as a block. Um, and here's the danger. They will seek to unify with Germany as a power block. Again, pushing Germany eastwards towards Russia. Dangerous, very dangerous. The Baltics will immediately collapse into unfinished business. Um, if you think the Serbs will ever 
allow Kosovo to be an independent nation, you don't know the Serbs. Um, you don't understand Pristina. You don't understand Serb Serbian history. Uh, and 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 you know the there's a battlefield in 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 um, in, in in Kosovo where you know the the Serbs define their their national identity from this. So they're not going to allow Kosovo just to drift away. And if you remove NATO, that means you remove the NATO peacekeeping forces, which means Serbia is marching right back into Kosovo. And there will be a general war in the Balkans. You'll see Bosnia explode. Uh, you'll see um, unfinished business between Macedonia and, and, and uh, other nations. Um, it, it, Europe will, will collapse into chaos, anarchy, war, misery. That's the reality of Europe's future. Europe is not a healthy continent. It never has been. The European continent has been the touchstone of wars for centuries. The Crusades came from Europe. Okay, both world wars began in Europe. Uh, the potential for a third world war resides in Europe. The greatest crimes against humanity came from European countries. Um, this is not a good place. I mean, I love Europe. I love visiting Europe. I think it's a beautiful continent. I think, you know, and, and for a while there, we had this romantic notion that you could go to Europe on your singular passport and travel freely and see the beautiful sights of Europe. But it was, it's all fake. It's all fake. Um, and, and, and Europe has been so focused on the two artificialities. The first artificiality is the artificiality of NATO. That there, that there can be this singular uh, military alliance. No, there can't. Um, and then the other artificiality is the, the notion of the, um, the Eurozone, uh, the, a singular currency. Um, the economic disparity in Europe is too great, has never been able, you've never been able to um, successfully marry Greece, Southern Italy, Portugal, Spain into um, you know, the, the, the Central European economic model. Uh, and 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 that it's always been something that's tearing Europe apart, and um, it will continue to do so, especially now that we have um, we have yet to see what the ultimate economic harm to Europe will be for its suicidal policy of sanctioning Russia and Russian energy. So, uh, what is the future of Europe? It's a bad future. It's a bleak future, um, and 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 that's just the reality. And 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 then Europe will regain its rightful place in the world, which is as a dysfunctional continent um, that's going to fall behind from the, the new economic reality that exists in the you know, trans-Eurasia. Um, you know, the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians and the Central Asian countries are coming to Turkey, are all going to come together and form this, you know, trans-Eurasian economic union. Um, they're not going to play games about a single currency. They're going to be realistic and understand that currencies will trade, uh, but they're going to emphasize economic stability over military dominance. You're not going to see a, a, a Russian-Chinese military alliance like NATO. Um, I mean, and, and this is the problem. NATO is poison, pure poison, and it has poisoned Europe, uh, and it is destroying Europe and it will destroy Europe. So with all that you said, and there is a lot of truth in what you just said, I just want to add to that something from me. Those two world wars that, yes, took place in Europe, they also had the coalition and agreement and some alliance from United States as well. I'm talking about certain people in certain places orchestrating certain events to take place. And again, who paid the price for it is regardless what continent we are talking, right? We're talking people paid the price for it. And I agree throughout the history and even my home country, war after war after war after war, there was a point when Poland didn't exist on the maps at all. They divided it, then it appeared again. All of this is deeply rooted in the psyche of people. And I know this. And, and I truly 
think that in these times we are living right now, there is a lot of people, I really not only hope, I, I feel that they can see through that. So they can look at another human being for the heart of that person, for the goodness, in spite of what you just said, which is so true, those animosities and historical remembrance, right? What took place. But I just want to add that. Scott, one time when we talk, it was off the recording. Um, you said something about United States bases, what this really costs to the country when United States has the military bases in the country. It was very interesting. I didn't record this because it was private after we had conversation, but I actually went and I look some facts and I wanna share this with you and I want you to explain to the audience what this really means for the country, for the citizens of the country. So apparently there are roughly 650 US foreign military bases. They are spread across 80 nations. After the US, the UK is second, but they only have 145 bases. Russia has about 3000 and China has just five. So this makes United States that has three times as many bases as any other country combined. Please tell us what does it really mean in real life? All those bases spread all around 80 nations. There are different kinds of bases. Um, so what we're calling a base is a military installation that is that has a permanent or near permanent presence of, um, of American military forces. Some of these bases are expeditionary in nature, meaning that the forces rotate in and out on a non-permanent basis. Um, and and, and they, those generally exist in um, high threat areas where, where there's a need for security, where there's usually uh, some sort of um, you know, conflict taking place in the, in the vicinity. The uh, direct impact on the um, host nation of these kind of bases is minimal from a socioeconomic perspective. Um, the primary impact is political, geopolitical in nature, um, meaning that uh, the, the contact between the American forces and the local economy is, uh, is reduced, is, is minimized. Um, and then you, you'll have other installations, um, for instance, some of the, you know, Ronald Reagan, not Ronald Reagan, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, when he was Secretary of Defense, talked about um, breaking away from the old traditional huge American military permanent installation, and instead uh, creating what are called lily pads, uh, smaller uh, bases in Europe that can be used as a launching pad for American forces going into the Middle East or going into Afghanistan. And so these lily pads are uh, facilities that have large military purpose, but small military footprints, if that makes any sense. Uh, that means, for instance, in Ukraine, uh, you had American military personnel going to Ukraine prior to this uh, conflict and training the Ukrainian forces. In Romania, the same thing. Um, but we're talking, you know, several hundred American troops. Uh, again, on a rotational basis, they're not bringing their families. Uh, they do have contact with the local community, but it's absorbed into the contact that already exists between the local community and their own military forces. So there's a dilution of the impact of, of having the Americans right there. Um, and it's also a more controlled um, contact because generally speaking, the contact that takes place is seen as an extension of the cooperation between the United States and the nation that they're training. Um, and then we have the large, sprawling, permanent American military installations that are home to thousands, if not tens of thousands, of American personnel on a permanent basis. That means that units are permanently assigned there. Um, now, in the, in the US military, um, you know, you're, 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 you tend to rotate soldiers through, or sailors, airmen, Marines, uh, through a, a unit, you know, every th three years, 
about, about. I mean, some some tours are two years, some tours can be as many as five years. I, I don't know what the economic reality is today. Um, I know there was a time where the military was seeking to lengthen tours to reduce the expense of travel. Uh, you know, PCS, permanent change of station uh, moves. I don't know where, where that stands. I know when I was in, uh, you could expect to move every two to three years. On average, two and a half years is when you got orders um, to, to move to another uh, organization. Mm -hmm. So even though a, a unit, uh, let's say, you know, hypothetically speaking, you know, Brigade X is stationed in Germany permanently, uh, you'll have a rotation of American forces there. So you don't have Ameri you don't have me permanently living there. I'm rotating through, but that's the case with every installation. So you, but what I'm what I'm bringing up is that you have a class of humanity that is transitory in nature. If you join the military, you don't have a home. Your home is wherever the government sends you. That includes if you're married with kids, because they tend to follow you to these permanent installations. Uh, but a lot of guys aren't married. And a lot of times when, you, when you're when you sent overseas, your families don't come with you, um, depending on the nature of the orders, et cetera. Uh, but you have this, this transitory horde of primarily young men, increasingly now young women, who are, are moved around. Now, they're, they've joined an organization that where violence factors in a major way. Um, the military, it doesn't exist to do humanitarian service. It does do humanitarian service. I mean, the, the beauty of having a highly disciplined force of professionals uh, who are trained to think on their feet and be flexible is that they can respond to just about any situation. And so if there's a flood, if there's a volcano, if there's something, the military can come in and do amazing things. They really can. Hats off to them. They are heroes. They come in and they literally save thousands of lives. That's not why they exist. They exist to kill thousands of lives. The military exists for the sole purpose of defeating their enemy on the field of battle. Now, that, that applies to the infantrymen up front and the supply clerk in the back. Even though the supply clerk's not killing people himself, he's part of a system that's geared towards creating the potential of increased lethality at the tip of the spear. The whole mindset is kill, kill, kill. And if you don't believe me, go to basic training and listen to what the recruits are saying as they're putting a bayonet. I don't think they do bayonet drills anymore, but as they're doing something, kill, kill, kill. That's what it's about. And if it's not, then we shouldn't have a military. I'm just being honest. We have a military to protect a nation from potential threats, if those, if those threats manifest themselves in a way where it necessitates conflict, we need an organization capable of killing because we want to win. So it has to be capable of killing better than the other organizations capable of killing. That's okay, but understand there are consequences for this. And when you take thousands or tens of thousands of young men and women uh, who are aggressive now, who are um, feeling their oats, who are sexually active, um, and that sexual activity is enhanced by the compression of aggression, uh, and then you impose them on peaceful civilian socioeconomic systems, um, it is not a marriage made in heaven. We see that in the United States. Ask anybody who wants to live um, on the outside outskirts of a base, um, uh, either the, a Marine installation in Jacksonville, North Carolina, or an Army installation in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Ask anybody honestly, do you want to live in the immediate area surrounding the base full of strip joints, hookers, bars, uh, you know, all the things that, that, that feed the mm -hmm. sexuality of these people? Because that's what it is. If they're not trying to kill people, they're trying to have sex with people. That's the truth. And so nobody wants to live there. And so if you're going to invite an American military presence onto your soil, Poland, a permanent American military presence, understand what's going to happen. Your society is going to change. Ask the people of Okinawa, how many sex clubs 
exist outside the base in Okinawa. We don't like to talk about it, but it's mm -hmm. there. They exist. How many sex clubs existed in the Philippines? Where did American military personnel go for liberty and recreation during the Vietnam War? Either the Philippines or Thailand. Why? Because they liked the scenery? No, because both Philippine and Thai society catered to them by creating a class of women who were sexually exploited. They existed for one reason and one reason only, which was to service the sexual needs of the American service members. End of story. No one can prove me wrong. Ask Hungary today. Ask Budapest what happens when all the NATO people come over to Budapest. Are they really coming to see the Twin Cities, the Danube? No, they're there to have sex. And they aren't having sex with Hungarian girls because the Hungarians have learned a long time ago, that's not what they want. So Hungary has created an underclass of sex slaves. They go out to the poor nations, to Moldova, to Ukraine, to Russia, and they recruit <laughs> these girls or they steal these girls, they kidnap these girls and they bring them in and they work in brothels to service the sexual needs of American and NATO members. Truth, harsh truth. Alcohol, these people tend to drink. They drink to excess. And when you have over sexualized men and women drinking, violence comes. So there's a lot of murders. There's a lot of assaults. There's a lot of rapes. Check the blotter of every single police department around and look, look at the, the high level of violent crimes that are committed by these service members. And we can go on and on and on. They, you know, they, they do bring some employment, restaurants, people like to eat, but remember people like to eat and drink. So it's very rare that you get a family restaurant. You tend to get the kind of restaurant that caters to the culinary taste of a young crowd, fast food, easy food, combined with alcohol, which then equates to violence. Um, so this is the reality. Prove me wrong, anybody who takes umbrage, Prove me wrong. There's a reason why my family didn't want to live on base in Germany. There's a reason. And that's the reason. We opted to live out in a German village, away from the nonsense of the immediacy of, 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 of uh, the American military buildup. We lived on the economy where we had a peaceful, um, you know, social uh, interaction with, uh, with, with, the, with the locals. We were a family. Um, so we behaved as a family. Uh, we, but you know, we weren't on a base full of young, single, testosterone-infused men and estrogen-infused infused women whose sole function, when they're not fighting or learning to fight or learning to kill or learning to their job, is to get drunk and get laid. I hate to be that, but that's what it's about. Um, yeah. So. You know, if Poland wants to invite American forces onto its soil, you're going to get what you ask for, Poland. It isn't going to be all bed and roses. It's going to be ugly. You're going to have high crime rates. And more, moreover, the United States is going to insult you by insisting that you sign a status of forces agreement that gives near immunity to Americans from prosecution of most crimes. Oh, this is huge. Yep. That's it, right? So now I would like to know, Scott, first of all, why so many bases, U.S. bases in the world? Why? Why this is not, why, why this is so necessary to, to take place? Well, again, each base has a, has a function. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of these bases are uh, Cold War relics. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're an extension of uh, the occupation of Europe or, or the continuation of an American military presence in Europe, um, you know, after World War II ended. Um, and, 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 and they were legacy bases. I mean, we had bases in, in England um, that were just, they, they existed because they existed in World War II. When we occupied Germany, we had 300,000 troops there. We had to build the bases capable of um, supporting these troops, and we had to spread them out because the way uh, 
you know, we were configured is to be prepared to repel a Soviet assault at a moment's notice. So we couldn't have all our forces in one area. And when the Soviets invade, we disperse. We had to have our bases located throughout Germany so that the units that were stationed there were near the area they were going to be asked to fight and defend. So we had to spread them out. Um, the same thing with aircraft. We had the airplanes and the aircraft you know, in, in different airfields, not just one central airfield. Uh, today, we've seen a consolidation uh, in Europe. We've seen a dramatic reduction in the number of bases in Europe. Um, and they, but they've been replaced because you say, well, okay, well, if they reduce, how can we still have so many bases? All right, well, the answer is because of Donald Rumsfeld's lily pad theory. Instead <laughs> of having a base with 10,000 Americans, we've now created a, a, an installation over here with 50 Americans, another installation over here with 100 Americans, another installation over here with 22 Americans. Um, so the number of bases goes up, the number of personnel, though, goes down. These aren't massive um, installations uh, as, as existed in the past. These are smaller, uh, you know, more focused installations that are, you know, that, that are designed to achieve um, a purpose beyond simply warehousing men and material. They're there to support a radar installation. They're there to support training. They're there to support an intelligence collection function and things of that nature. So the, the numbers are high, but if you take a look, the corresponding amount of personnel that are, that are involved is, is actually significantly lower than it was uh, years ago. Okay, I understand. Thank you. And now something that, a question that was born from this conversation. I didn't intend to ask it, but now I feel I have to. When I think about Russia's army, and when I think about, I will use United States because that's where I spent most of my life recently. And this whole woke culture with 54 genders um, that Facebook advertises. I don't see that type of ideology in Russia, right? I would like to know your thoughts, your opinion. How do you see the future of American army and military in comparison to that in Russia? Because this is very, very different on this level of understanding that I have. Thank you for asking that question. Um, <laughs> It's, it's not an easy question to answer, and I'll tell you why. Because in the United States, we have a, a, a principle that's just founded in solid rock, and that is civilian control of the military. Civilian control of the military. Um, and that's what makes America, I believe, great, because we have done our best to eliminate the potential of a military coup. We've done our best to keep the military out of politics. The military is a very powerful organization, but it's supposed to be apolitical. It's supposed to serve whoever the civilian master is. This is why um, I could have, for instance, I joined um, when Jimmy Carter was president. And although today I've grown to respect Jimmy Carter as a man more than anybody else. I mean, he is He's a mensch. He's, 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 he's good. He's a good guy. Um, but I didn't like him as president. I thought he was weak. Um, but he was my commander in chief. So if he ordered me to do something, I would obey that order as if it was given from the voice of God because he was the voice of God. He was my commander in chief. I didn't agree with his politics. But Ronald Reagan came in. Man, I was happy when Ronald Reagan came in. That, that was a guy I wanted to take orders from. I was ready to march with Ronald Reagan. I was continuing to be ready to march. And in fact, I did march with George um, H.W. Bush. Um, I was happy with both those presidents. Then Slick Willie came in. Bill Clinton, not happy. Still in the military, had to obey the orders because apolitical. And it has to be that way. When the civilian leadership says something, the military must obey that order. It has to. Now, there's a, a, a problem, um, and I'll, I'll speak just as, as a Marine. Um, the Marines were always the last to um, effectively integrate women. And I'm going to say this as a father of uh, twin daughters. 
uh, if you tell me my daughters are incapable of doing something, I'll punch you in the face. All right? They're as capable of doing anything a man can do, except kill people. All right? My daughters can't serve in the Marine Corps, not the Marine Corps that I was familiar with. They can't. They're not physically able to. Uh, they may want to, and there may be women out there who can do this job. You know, there's some impressive physical specimens out there in, 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 in womankind uh, who can, they're stronger than I am. They have more stamina than I am. Um, God bless them if they want to join the Marine Corps. But the problem is they're the exception to the rule. Um, the, the, the Marine Corps was all about lethality. Okay, we're coming back to what I talked about, killing bad guys. And we created some of the most lethal combat formations in the history of the world. If you close with an, a Marine Corps unit, you will lose, guaranteed. And you will lose badly because all we do is kill. We're good at it. But then the civilian leadership said, you have to include women. Now, the Marine Corps tried its best to, to approach this problem from a fact-based perspective. They actually created test bed units where they incorporated women fairly, brought them in, trained them up, and then they did side-by-side -side comparisons with all male units. They found a couple things. One, combat effectiveness dropped measurably, and the casualty rate of the other unit increased. So the Marine Corps <laughs> lesson from this is that if you compel us to integrate women into combat arms, we will become less lethal and we will suffer more casualties. And so they begged the military, don't make us do this, because our job isn't to reflect American society. The Marine Corps is not meant to be a reflection of American society. The Marine Corps is meant to be the most lethal tool in the American arsenal, so that when we pull this sword, the sword cuts purely and clean and effectively and efficiently. That's not what the civilian leadership wanted. They wanted a military that reflected uh, the norms and values of the society it served. And that's the civilian leadership's right. They're allowed to do that. And if they order the military to adjust accordingly, the military must do so. And the Marine Corps has. And the Marine Corps has integrated women. Uh, and, and the women that have been brought in are serving admirably, honorably. God bless them. Because when the, bullet go, when the balloon goes up, they're going to die just like the men that they serve alongside you. They're going to pay the same price that the men pay. And you have to respect somebody who's willing to put themselves on the line like that. So that, that is what it is. Now, now we live in a, a day and age where, and again, I think one of the, 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 the wonders of, my, of, of, of America um, is that we are very diverse and very tolerant. Um, you know, who am I to tell somebody that you can't be happy? Uh, who am I to say that uh, what, you, what you embrace is, is your familial norm is unacceptable to me because I embrace something else? Um, you know, I, 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 I am deeply appreciative of the willingness of my country to be as open as possible to all walks of life. Um, and I'm not going to say anymore because I don't want to offend anybody, or, but I think you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And I, as, as somebody in the military, would fight and die for anybody's right to be who they are and what they are, so long as they're not hurting anybody else. Um, you know, who you sleep with is your business, your business, not my business, not anybody's business. But. <laughs> Civilian society is able to absorb more diversity and continue to function efficiently than the military. The military is not meant to be a diverse social experiment. The military is meant to be a unitary force solely focused on killing, solely focused on killing. We've already diluted that by forcing men and women to come together in a way that's not natural. And I don't mean that from God and all that. I'm saying that in the infantry, uh, it's not natural to have a woman who can't carry the same amount of weight over the same distance as a man. Um, now, 
women are going to scream from the top of their lungs. Well, you let in, you know, PFC Sanchez, and he weighs 105 pounds, and he can't bench press 300 pounds, and, uh, you know, da 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 Yep, I did. Sanchez proved himself in basic training to the standards that were set by the Marine Corps. We didn't have to reduce any standards to let Sanchez in. But if you're telling me that Jane Doe could do perform to the same level as Sanchez, I say, bring her in. Bring her in right now. But Jane Doe can't. We had to adjust the standard so that Jane Doe could graduate and become a Marine. So we lowered the standards of the Marine Corps to make this adjustment, and therefore we lowered the capability of the Marine Corps. Uh, but that's okay. We did it because the civilian leadership said that's what we want. Therefore, the new norm in the Marine Corps is less lethal, more likely to uh, su you know, sustain casualties in the combat arms. Um, but now we're saying that we, we have to – see, the thing about civilian life is that, for instance, if I – you know, right now it's um, – God, you're, you're heading me down a path. You know, I'm trying to come off as very tolerant because I am very tolerant, but I'm as um, guilty of personal prejudices as anybody else. Uh, and this is, um, they, they, they used to have a term for it. I, I, I don't want to use the wrong term, but we're, it's inclusion month. <laughs> um, Correct. We celebrate diverse lifestyles. Yes. Um, and, the, and the beauty of this is there, there's going to be a parade and there's going to be a celebration uh, in, in Albany. And if you want to go, go, go. I support going. I support the ability to have this parade. Uh, but I don't want to attend. I want to stay home because I'm not comfortable in that environment. I'm going to stay home. That's my right. Um, <laughs> in the military, you don't have a right to say no now because it's being forced on you. Um, inclusion, diversity is now being pushed down the same way that um, gender integration was. And this is having, I believe, a, an extraordinarily detrimental impact on unit cohesiveness and unit functionality and unit lethality. Um, when you're focused on issues that have nothing to do with closing with and destroying the enemy through firepower manure, when you forget what your primary mission is, and instead you have turned the military into a social experiment, an extension of the social experiment that's taking place in your country, um, you're, you're, you're losing your ability to win wars. And I, I do believe that um, the United States will not fare well in the next war, in the initial phases of the next war. Now, I'm a firm believer that um, you know the, the lessons of reality tend to compel organizations to make adjustments. And um, I can pretty much guarantee that if we are involved in a lengthy drawn out fight in Europe, that the uh, US um, infantry division that exist in Europe six months after the war start will look completely different from the U.S. Infantry Division that started the war. That the U.S. military out of the interest of survival will uh, eliminate all of the nonsense and get back to the business of creating an organization singularly focused on killing. That organization is going to look very much like an all-male organization. But comparing that to Russia, Scott, Russia doesn't have this kind of... Um, Russians, are, R Russians right now are uh, in the business of killing people. Yeah. Okay. So the they're not perfect. Let's just make it clear. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm very, very much aware of the professionalism of the Russian officer class. Mm -hmm. I'm very much aware of the professionalism of the Russian... Uh, soldiers, uh, the lethality of their weapons, um, and the fact that they have, um, you know, a, a, a very disciplined and professional approach towards organization and uh, combat operations. But they're not perfect. They make mistakes. And if they were fighting an American organization, our job would be to find those mistakes and exploit them and kill as many Russians as possible. And we would. The Russians aren't perfect. They're not supermen. They're not 10 feet tall. 
but they also aren't being distracted by nonsense. What I mean by nonsense isn't, I, I, again, if I were gay, I would not want to live in Russia because Russia is not tolerant of homosexuality. I wouldn't want to live in the United States. If I were transgendered, I would not want to live in Russia because Russia is not tolerant. I would want to live in the United States. Um, you know, that's just a, that's just a reality. Uh, and I think Russia is less for it as a society um, for, for intolerance. But I respect Russia's reasons why they don't want that because Russia looks at the West and says, that's not us. That's not who we want to be. And I respect that. But I'm just saying that America is a nation that is inclusive, diverse, and I think we're better for it um, in a non-military way. But in the business of killing, um, you know, Russia isn't um, distracted. Russia isn't having uh, inner debates about um, sex change operations. Russia isn't worrying about whether or not a soldier goes to a male bathroom or a female bathroom, um, you know, depending on not on their biological uh, realities, but on what they feel inside them. Um, they're not worried about, um, you know, the complexities of homosexual relationships in a primarily all male, um, you know, combat unit where, you know, men still shower together, men are in close intimate contact with each other in the field and uh, what this does. Uh, and, and I'll also say this, if you don't think there's homosexuals in the Russian military, you don't know anything about homosexuality. Homosexuality exists. Um, the Russians have just driven it you know, underground the way we used to in the United States. There are, a, there are scores of homosexuals, thousands of homosexuals in the Russian military. They just hide it. They hide it because they have to hide it. So it's there, it's real, but that's, that's, that's not the point. The point is that, you know, if you take uh, an American captain and his Russian counterpart, and you take a look at their training schedules for a month, the American captain has to do so much nonsense, so much garbage, so much administrative goo-goo um, related to, you know, sexual violence, um, transgendered rights, um, tolerance, et cetera. The last thing they're focused on is killing. The Russian's focused on killing. He doesn't have any of this other stuff to, to distract him. And that will pay off when it comes time to go to war. Russia will have the edge in the initial moments of any conflict because they're not distracted with societal imperatives. They're focused on military reality. Mm -hmm. So let's stay in that region now, Scott. Is the war with Ukraine? over not even close um because the war's changed you know when the special milk you know I, I get pushback from um you know, I, I write for a number of outlets and i get pushback from certain editors mm -hmm. sometimes about the use of the term special military operation they say oh that's a russian propagandist term that you need to call it what it is war invasion I have no problem with the term invasion, but it's not a war. <laughs> if it was a war, it wouldn't be called a special military operation. I apologize. I had to rephrase it because I am actually the first one who would say <laughs> that this was the special military operation. So is the special military operation in Ukraine over? No. The special military operation in Ukraine is, um, let, let's, let's focus on what it was intended to do. The primary objective of the special military operation was to liberate Donbas, liberate Lugansk and Donetsk from Ukraine. Um, in order to do that, the Russians needed to defeat the Ukrainian military. Um, Russia early on took a tack uh, that sought the nine, the, 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 to, to minimize the level of violence necessary to do this. Um, they, they, they sought to um, have arrangements with uh, Ukrainian civilian leaders and military leaders uh, that, that would allow the Russian military to come in and achieve its objectives of eliminating NATO infrastructure in Ukraine. Um, Russia encouraged Ukrainian forces to stay in their barracks. Um, this did not happen uh, for whatever reason. I think it's an intelligence failure. I think that the Russian FSB, the Fifth Department, um, went in believing that they had accomplished uh, the objective of getting these guarantees from civilian and military leadership. Um, 
they were either incompetent and in that they misperceived reality or they were they were they were uh, defeated from a counterintelligence standpoint I meaning the ukrainians led them to believe something but uh, the, the the opposite was the truth the russian military went in um seeking to rapidly move forward um there's numerous anecdotal stories of russian troops entering into a ukrainian uh town village city uh being assured by the political leadership that uh, there would be no resistance leaving a small residual force behind and pushing forward only to have Ukrainian forces appear, slaughter the troops that were there, and then ambush the troops that had gone forward. Um, so, you know, the, the, the um, operation was complicated by what I call a failure of intelligence early on. Um, it's also complicated by the fact that there were a significant number of Ukrainian forces, highly trained, well-equipped, uh, well-led, uh, who are now going to fight. Um, and Russia had to shape the battlefield, which means they couldn't focus solely on liberating uh, Don Donbass. They had to focus on keeping hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian forces away from the Donbass, et cetera. That's phase one. They had to degrade the military, et cetera. On March 25th, Russia announced that phase one was over. And they were now moving on to phase two, which was the completion of the liberation of Donbass. Phase two had some expanded territorial aspects to it as well. Um, the the uh, establishment of a land bridge connecting Crimea with Donbass and the Russian Federation uh, through Mariupol. Um, this this had to be conducted. This allowed Russia to have operational um, flexibility and it kept Ukraine away from the Sea of Azov. Um, the expansion of Crimea into Kherson Oblast uh, region for the purpose of, one, securing the water supply for Crimea. Uh, it had been cut off by the Ukrainians in 2014. And two, to create a strategic buffer between Crimea and Ukraine. Um, and this was accomplished, but the primary goal it was still the liberation of Donbass. This was a very tough nut to crack. I don't think anybody who wasn't intimately following uh, developments in, in the Donbass over the last eight years, myself included, uh, understood the extensive nature of the defensive positions that Ukraine had built in Donbass. Reinforced concrete bunkers, trench lines, uh, homes that had been fortified, basements that had been turned into strong points, villages that were linked as, into this defensive belt that was now very deep. Um, so anybody who tried to rush this defensive belt with a bunch of tanks and everything would be slaughtered. Um, this defensive belt had to be taken down position by position, a grinding, grinding war. And Russia made the decision that because um, normally, I'll, I'll tell you, from my Marine Corps experience, fortunately only in training, not in combat, uh, the reduction of a fortified defensive position is the most difficult kind of fighting. And it inevitably leads to heavy casualties on the part of those attacking. Uh, in every exercise that we ran, taking out a fortified uh, you know, bunker complex where the bunkers were supporting one another with fire, with trench lines, et cetera, um, you know, the, the initial assault units were slaughtered, decimated. Um, and it, it was only the, the units coming in from behind that continued the fight. They were slaughtered and decimated. You just had to keep pushing till you punched through. Um, the Russians said, we're not playing that game. <laughs> we're just not going to play the game. We're, we're going to sacrifice um, men and materiel to get through these defensive lines. What we're going to do is we're going to pull back and we're going to pound them with artillery. Pound them, pound them, pound them, pound them. And then we're going to move in and clear the zone that has been pounded, and then we're going to stop, regroup, pound the next one. And it's slow fighting, slow, and it's dangerous for the Ukrainians and dangerous for the Russians, because if you don't get everybody and you come forward, they get you. Um, it's slow, lethal conflict, and that's been going on. And it's taken a lot longer than I think most people ever imagined. Most people who weren't Russians. The Russians are like, we don't care how long it takes. Exactly. We, we, we don't have a, a, a calendar that says we must be finished by this date. You remember all the talk about Russia had to do X by May 9th. So Correct. Yes. Putin could care less. 
Putin wasn't wasn't looking at May 9th. Putin was telling <laughs> his generals, do what you need to do on the timeline. You need to do it. I will provide you with all the resources you need to get this done within the confines of the special military operation, which means we're not going to generally mobilize. Um, it's not a war. You've got 200,000 guys. I can give you 10,000 here, 10,000 there to reinforce, but you're not getting much more. You've got to go to war with the, 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 the resources you have. And the Russian leadership has done this. Um, and they're on the verge of, of, of achieving their objectives. 95% uh, of Lugansk has been um, recaptured. Um, uh, and, 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 and Donetsk is, is, is slowly falling under the, the control of the Russian forces. Um, the battles of encirclement that we talked about uh, in, before are taking place. Uh, in fact, Arestovich, uh, the, the, the deputy of uh, Zelensky, uh, came out either yesterday or the day before and said, we're about to have a whole bunch of um, uh, defeats on the scale of Mariupol, that uh, the Russians are, are ready to encircle thousands of uh, Ukrainian forces, and we're going to lose them forever. Um, this, is a bad, this is a bad situation. This is happening as we speak. But once that ends, you know, then what? Now, when the Russians started the special military operation, it was based upon the notion that Russia was going to be fighting a Ukrainian military with finite resources. And if you take a look at the phase one operation, Russia sought to destroy um, the petroleum refining capabilities of Ukraine. They, they destroyed ammunition supply depots. They destroyed um, you know, military training facilities. The idea was to degrade Ukraine's um, ability to sustain conflict so that while the units on the front lines were being uh, neutralized and, and, and degraded, uh, Ukraine lacked the ability to reconstitute these units. Um, and if that had stayed in place, then this victory that Russia is about to achieve in the Donbass would have meant total victory over Ukraine. Because once Russia destroys the Ukrainian army in the east, there will be nothing left. Um, but war is not static, meaning that the conditions that existed in February and March uh, and early April. Um, aren't the conditions that exist today. When the war started, the United States uh, and Europe were very uh, hesitant about providing heavy weapons to Ukraine. You remember the debates, Ukraine was screaming, give us airplanes, give us a no-fly zone, give us tanks, give us everything. And they're like, no, we don't want to um, create the potential for escalation of, uh, of conflict with, with Russia. Um, things have changed. Things have changed to the tune of $53 billion. That's the amount of aid that the United States has provided Ukraine this year alone, $53 billion. The total Russian defense budget for 2021 was $63 billion. When you eliminate things like pensions and ice cutters and you know, things that have no operational value, that number drops to around $45 billion. But when you parse that down from research and development, the nuclear cost, the fleet, et cetera, the total amount of money that Russia uses for operations and to procure equipment like tanks, artillery, et cetera, is $8 billion for one year. Now we've provided Ukraine with $53 billion in four months. Now we can parse this out because a lot of that isn't going to be used for the acquisition of material. A lot of it is used for other things, but the amount of money that is set aside for the direct acquisition of, um, of military material, tanks, artillery, et cetera, is around $7.528 billion. So we have provided Ukraine in four months with the amount of military equipment and operational support that Russia spends in one year. Taxpayers' okay. money is cut, right? American taxpayers' well, money. Well, I mean, Ostensibly, um, you know, we, we in America we we have the ability for the Fed to just print money. So, oh um, yeah, well, even when there's not enough taxpayer money, we just print it, so it doesn't matter. Um, but yes, no taxpayer money uh, allocated by the United States Congress through various uh, laws and and, and acts, uh, and then implemented by the president in his role as the executive. Um, so, what I'm trying to get at is, eight billion dollars buys a lot of equipment whole lot of equipment. This war, remember when we were talking about the, 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 the way Russia was reducing the Ukrainian defenses using artillery. 
So this is an artillery war. In the last month and a half, Ukraine has been provided with over 300 heavy artillery pieces. That's the equivalent of 20 battalions of heavy artillery. The Marine Corps, the organization that I was a member of, only has 11 battalions of heavy artillery. So we've provided the Ukrainian military with nearly twice the number of battalions of heavy artillery that the US Marine Corps has. And the reason why I bring that up is that there, there's a certain class of military analyst out there who is dismissive of this military aid, saying it's, it, it can't change anything. The Russians are going to win. Russia is going to win. But this does change things because Russia has not shown itself capable of stopping this material from coming in. That's a problem. Russia also cannot go out and touch what I call the strategic depth that's been created by NATO when they made the decision to provide this heavy weaponry. Uh, it used to be that, you know, the, the, the theory was that the weapons would have to be brought into Ukraine, then Ukrainians would have to train on them in Ukraine, and they would be vulnerable to attack and interdiction by the Russians. But the Ukrainians, for instance, recently acquired 12 uh, Caesar um, 155 millimeter self-propelled uh, artillery pieces uh, from France. Um, and, this, and this is a very lethal piece of equipment. Uh, the French military went to southern France and trained for weeks on this equipment. Russia couldn't attack them. They were in France learning how to use this equipment, how to fire it, how to maintain it, et cetera. And then so that when that equipment appeared on Ukrainian soil, it was combat ready, combat ready. And it immediately went to the front lines. Now, you can believe Ukrainian propaganda or you not. I, I take everything with a grain of salt. But the Ukrainians claim that the, the Caesar-equipped battalion has destroyed over 40 Russian artillery pieces. I have no reason to doubt them because they're very lethal. Uh, they've probably killed hundreds of Russian soldiers. They've probably destroyed dozens of Russian armored vehicles. Um, now, is that going to change the outcome of the war? No. But it is killing more Russians and destroying more Russian equipment. Russians that wouldn't have died or equipment that wouldn't have been destroyed had this equipment not been provided. That's just 12 French-made howitzers. 300 artillery pieces have been provided, including advanced M77A2 um, American-made howitzers that are equipped with the Excalibur GPS-guided munitions so that when Ukraine is provided with real-time intelligence from the United States intelligence community about the location of a Russian battalion command post, they're able to put a 155 millimeter round right on that command post, killing the command staff of that battalion. That's happening. Is it gonna change the outcome of the war? No, Russia's gonna win, but there'll be more dead Russians. And so when people say that this isn't having an impact, I say, you have no clue what you're talking about. It's having a huge impact because the special military operation has a finite number of troops. There is no general mobilization. Ukraine is able to dip into the bottomless resources of NATO and the United States. As we destroy these artillery pieces, more will come in. More will come in. More will come in. And they will keep coming as long as Ukrainians are killing Russian soldiers, which is all NATO wants. NATO knows that Ukraine will not win this conflict. They know that Russian victory is inevitable. What they want to do is make the price paid by Russia so high that Russia is too weak to ever again consider doing something like this down the road. I think NATO will fail. But my point is, anybody who thinks this conflict is over when the last Donetsk city falls don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, came out today and said, this will be over when we accomplish all of our stated objectives. That's it. Which means that even though you seize the Donbass and liberate it from Ukraine, what about denazification? When will that be over? You know, Russia hasn't quite told us what they mean by denazification, but they've implied it. 
It means denazification. It means no Nazis left in Ukraine. It means that uh, Ukrainian government right now, which has uh, banned all political parties except the Nazi parties, probably can't continue to exist. Uh, it, I would definitely hope that it means that the statue of Stepan Bandera is blown up, and that all memorials set up for the glorification of uh, the Nazi past of Ukraine are destroyed, that the constitution is changed not only to reflect that Crimea is forever Russia, but also to ban permanently all uh, you know, Ukrainian nationalistic, political, politicized sentiment. Um, how do you achieve that? Uh, that's going to require the political defeat of Ukraine, which means that this war is going to have to go on until so much pain has been inflicted on Ukraine that they have no choice but to accept the terms that Russia is dictating. There will not be a negotiated settlement here. A negotiation is when you and I sit down as equals and we come up with a deal. Now, what's happening right now is I'm telling you, you're going to surrender and these are the terms. And if you don't want it, we'll just keep killing you. And unfortunately, NATO is happy with allowing Ukrainian soldiers and civilians to continue to die in large numbers because they don't care about Ukraine. They have never cared about Ukraine. They never will care about Ukraine. All they care about is inflicting harm on Russia. And so that's the reality. The other the reality is, you know, Russia said, um, you know, demilitarization. That meant getting rid of NATO infrastructure. What's happening right now is that the Ukrainian military is becoming more of a NATO-like organization than they were before the war started, especially with this massive infusion of mm -hmm. NATO technology, NATO weaponry. So Russia is going to have to completely destroy the Ukrainian military. They have no choice. That's their state of objective. And Lavrov said, we're not stopping until all objectives have been met. And then the Ukrainian government is going to have to agree to permanent neutrality and to the permanent loss of significant territory. And this goes beyond Crimea and Donbass, which Zelensky has said he may have to be willing to consider. Well, the Russians said, that was the old, that was the old negotiation. We don't negotiate with anymore. Right now, if you stop, it's Crimea, Donbass, but it's also a significant portion of uh, Eastern Ukraine and Southern Ukraine. You've lost Kherson, You've lost Aparizia. Um, you're never going to get it back, Zelensky, ever. You've lost it forever. And if you want to continue this fight, you're probably going to lose Odessa. That's what I want to ask you. That's what I want to ask you about Odessa. I think it's, it's history. I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. One, Odessa is the place where the Ukrainian neo-Nazis burned to death nearly 50 ethnic Russians. Russia has never forgotten. Russia has never forgiven. Odessa will never be Ukraine because of that. But there's other reasons as well. It's not just that Odessa has a significant population of ethnic Russians um, that don't identify with the nationalistic uh, policies of the Zelensky government or the neo-Nazi ideology of the political parties that uh, exist in Ukraine today. It's because Odessa under Ukrainian leadership will forever pose a threat to Russia. Um, a lot of Ukrainians cheered when they sank the Moskva, the Russian cruiser that was the flagship of the Black Sea fleet. When the Moskva sank, I said, there goes Odessa because the Russians will never allow Ukraine to have access to a coastline where they can deploy missiles that can threaten Russian ships to a depth in the Black Sea. Um, Ukraine will be Russia. It has to be Russia. And then there's the other issue, Transnistria. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a, um, a, a geopolitical thorn inside of everybody. I mean, I don't even think Russia is happy about Transnistria, to be honest, because, you know, the 40th Army uh, and the collapse of the Soviet Union sort of declared a reality that uh, Russia was compelled to, uh, to embrace, but it's, it's, it's been an inconvenience to everybody. Um, but Vladimir Putin has said he is the president of all Russia, all Russia, and that includes Transnistria. Um, even though it's not part of the Russian Federation, there are Russians there. So Putin is going to defend the Russians. Um, 
and I think that there is a recognition that to leave transit Syria out there isolated like this is just <clears throat> um, creating the potential of a broader conflict with Moldova. That if you actually want to prevent a war between Russia and Moldova, Russia and Romania, you need to seize Odessa and link um, southern Ukraine with Transnistria to create a single bridge, a Russian bridge. Uh, it'll cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea. I can't shed any tears. Ukraine lost the right to have access to the Black Sea when they allowed neo-Nazis to burn to death 50 Russian ethnic, uh, ethnic Russians um, on May 14th in 2014. They lost the right to have access to the Black Sea when they made the decision to sink the Moskva. Now people say, wait a minute, can't Ukraine defend itself? Because this is a big, this is a big deal. Because you see there's a debate right now. Why can't Ukraine attack Russia? I'll tell you why. Because this isn't war. This is a special military operation carried out by Russia to eliminate the most odious political ideology in existence in Europe today. Nazis don't have rights. End of story. And Ukraine has defined itself as a Nazi nation. You don't have rights, Ukraine. None. Zero. Get used to it. Because you have allowed yourself to be converted into a Nazi state. Um, and you're a criminal state. And Therefore, you don't have the right to do things that normal militaries would. I mean, Russia, you know, you can defend yourself on Ukrainian soil. I mean, even a criminal barricaded in a home will, will fight against the police. But you don't have the right to go out and carry attacks against Russia or sink Russian ships in the Black Sea because you're a criminal entity. You are Nazis. Now, if you believe you have the right, you want to exercise this right, so be it. But understand there will be a penalty because justice will be applied. And when justice hits Ukraine, that justice is going to be harsh. And it's going to include the loss of Odessa, loss of access to the Black Sea, uh, because the neo-Nazi um, affiliated regime of President Zelensky uh, can't be trusted by the Russian, by the ethnic Russians. No ethnic Russian can ever again trust the Ukrainians, never again. Ukrainian nationalism has reared its ugly head. We now know it for what it is, an evil, evil ideology. It must be eradicated completely. And if that means the loss of the Ukrainian nation, so be it. It's a choice Ukraine made. Now, hopefully the Ukrainian people are going to wake up and understand that what's happening right now is an irreversible tragedy for the Ukrainian nation. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that this is good. Ukraine was a united nation, a sovereign nation, a nation that had potential. That potential is being stripped away because Russia is seizing territories that will never return to Ukraine sovereign control and territories that were integral to the notion of a viable nation state for Ukraine. Whatever Ukraine emerges from this, this horrible tragedy that's taking place will be a completely different state. And we don't know what that's going to look like yet. We don't know if Poland is going to seek to seize Western Ukraine. We don't know if Hungary is going to seek to assert um, you know, sovereign control over the Hungarian population. We don't know what Romania is going to do. Um, this, you know, Things that were never a question. I mean, this time last year, no one was talking about Poland moving into Western Ukraine. No one. I mean, maybe there's some extreme Polish nationalists who sat down in their basement and got drunk and looked at a map and dreamed of a greater Poland, but it wasn't real. Well, it's real today. There's a real threat. I mean, so real that Belarus is mobilizing its forces uh, to prevent Poland from uh, undertaking any action of that nature. So I don't know what Ukraine will look like going forward. But what I can say is this. Every day that Zelensky continues to hold on to the hope of that his forces can somehow um, compel Russia to come to a negotiating table, he loses more of his country forever. It will never be the same. The longer they fight, the smaller Ukraine will become. Thank you for this explanation, Scott. But don't you think that military support, because as we know who Zelensky is, right? Like this is a puppet. 
and he is being orchestrated to continue with certain approach to this, right? So don't you think that support, because the Western media even is shifting, as you've noticed lately, there is some shift in attention to this situation or that there are some uh, publications that actually are stating things that three months ago, you will not believe that they will say that. What I'm going with this is, isn't it about the midterms? Isn't it stretching this support until November, let's say late October, and then like this, it's over. No more weapons, you're on your own. I mean, that, that's, that is not a illogical um, way of thinking. Um, the fact is, the Democrats, Biden administration cannot afford uh, a repeat of the Afghanistan debacle, where the United States ran away from an obligation. Uh, and so I think you're going to see the United States continuing to double down with military uh, support uh, for Ukraine um, to create the perception that we are a solid ally, a reliable ally, et cetera, um, for domestic political purposes. Um, and then, you know, after the, uh, the crushing defeat that they will suffer in the midterms, uh, I think you'll see the Biden administration uh, shift gears. Um, but that doesn't do Ukraine any good um, because Ukraine's going to be destroyed by the midterms. Um, you know, the, the only question that remains right now is what cost will be imposed on Russia for achieving its, its, its victory? Uh, and the Russians have already made it clear that they're not willing to suffer too much, too many more losses. Um, Russia has said, you know, and, and, and the United States, I mean, the, 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 we don't listen. We're not very good at listening as a nation. You know, there, we, we just agreed that we're going to provide Russia with what's called the HIMARS system, the, uh, the highly mobile artillery rocket system. Um, which has the ability to send precision guided munitions up to 70 kilometers uh, deep. Um, we, we said we're not gonna provide Ukraine with the, uh, with the, the tracked version, the M270, which fires 12 of these missiles. It has the potential to be converted to fire what's called an attackum, which is a 300 kilometer way. Right, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, we said, no, 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 we're only providing them with the, with the um, the vehicle mounted, the truck mounted one with only six launchers, no attack capability. And yet today there's um, images of M270 um, uh, multiple launch rocket systems being loaded onto American military aircraft for deployment to Europe to be turned over to the Ukrainians. So we lied. And the Russians yeah. have said that if you, if you do this, um, we will be forced to strike targets we have deliberately avoided striking. We will now have to strike the decision-making centers in Ukraine. Now, the Russians always have a nice way of uh, putting these terms, very copacetic, you know, decision-making centers. They're going to kill Zelensky. They've kept Zelensky alive because they believe there was a political viability to keeping this man alive so that there could be a peaceful outcome, that Zelensky, having been embraced by the West and touted by the West and elevated by the West as the singular political voice in Ukraine, Zelensky would be the person Russia needed to get the peace that it demanded. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Russia is coming to the realization that no, Zelensky is not in control of anything. Correct. Therefore, they are going to kill Zelensky. They're going to kill him by blowing up his presidential palace. They're going to eliminate the Ukrainian parliament because the parliament continues to pass laws attacking Russians, uh, attacking Russian uh, language, etc. That will be eliminated. They will destroy the Ukrainian uh, senior military leadership uh, that right now is able to meet uh, with impunity uh, and discuss um, operations that result in dead Russians. Now, if this was America waging this war, I'll tell you right now, none of these people we just talked about would be alive today. Because the way we fight a war is that we kill the command and control. 
of the enemy, or at least we try to. Saddam Hussein stayed alive during Desert Storm because he moved all the time. But believe me, I can tell you from personal experience, we tried to kill him. I tried to kill him. I was given the task of killing Saddam Hussein uh, because he is a legitimate command and control figure. Um, if we received information about the Iraqi general staff meeting, we would have bombed them and killed them all. Uh, that's just the way it is. Ukrainians are operating with impunity. They're doing whatever they want. Their parliament meets and passes hateful laws. Zelensky is able to sit in his presidential palace and have video conferences um, where billions of dollars of military aid is brought in. The Ukrainian military leadership is able to confer directly with NATO to get intelligence that is used to kill Russian soldiers. And the Russians, because it's a special military operation, have not struck them. That's about to change. That's about to change. Um, and I, I don't know if Zelensky realizes it, but he is literally a dead man walking, unless something dramatically changes and he accedes to Russia's demands. But he's under pressure from the West not to. He's under pressure to continue the resistance. Um, and one of the reasons why he's being provided with all this weaponry is to create the hope, the potential of uh, some sort of Ukrainian military victory. And remember, Ukraine wins simply by not losing. So as long as Ukraine is willing to sacrifice tens of thousands of lives, um, the West is willing to provide them with the weaponry that enables Ukraine to continue to resist. Ukraine will never win. Yeah. Russia loses by not winning. Ukraine wins by not losing. And so that's the the game that the West is playing is to create in the minds of Ukraine the ability for viable, sustainable resistance. They're not going to be able to achieve this. Russia will defeat them. But the West doesn't care. All the West cares about is making the price of the inevitable Russian victory so high that Russia will never again seek to do anything like this in Europe. Scott, my last question is a little bit different side. I could not stop thinking when I saw that clip when Bush made the mistake. <laughs> about, I have to ask you this question because I said to myself, next time I talk to Scott, I will ask you this. What did you think and how did you feel? My, like your first reaction to it. I stopped taking um, George W. Bush seriously a long time ago. He was a buffoon as president. He's a bigger buffoon today. Um, I mean, the, the man that we saw in that you know, interview, which of course was a put up, um, um, didn't deserve to be the president of the United States. He's not a man of the kind of stature. Again, we very rarely elect anybody who really deserves to be president. The presidency of the United States is an extraordinarily powerful position. It's one that's uh, imbued with, you know, not just tradition um, and, the, and, 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 and and represents the heritage of a nation, but it's a, a position that's been given extreme powers, extreme powers. And it needs to be, you know, these powers need to be wielded by a person, man or woman, who is mature, uh, mature, who is informed, who is educated, uh, who is imbued with humanity so that you don't be overwhelmed with hubris and arrogance. Because when you have this much power, you have the ability to reach out and crush a nation like Iraq anytime you want. But that doesn't make you powerful. That makes you weak. A weak person reaches out and crushes. A strong person keeps that power in and instead uses <clears throat> whatever force you have for the force of good, doing good. They're, they're, nonviolent ways of resolving crises. Um, but that requires somebody with genuine inner strength, inner peace. Um, and that literally doesn't define an American politician. American politicians are by nature the most narcissistic, um, arrogant, power hungry people on the planet. Um, this applies from the president on down. Um, they're creatures of um, a political system that requires them to uh, sell their souls to American corporate interests. Um, we, we have constitutional um, 
you know, decisions by the Supreme Court, Citizens versus United, that elevate corporations to be the saddest mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. And as a result, our politicians are bought and paid for by corporations. That's just a statement of fact. I don't like it. I'm not happy about it. But that's truth. And George W. H. W. No, George W. Bush is a is a product of this reality. He's an embarrassment. Um, and and you know people can chuckle at that, but the people that chuckle at that clip um, are themselves an embarrassment because there's nothing funny about that clip. That clip shows a despicable human being with no grasp of reality, no sense of uh, historical perspective, no guilt over what he did, uh, laughing about lying, laughing about um, committing crimes, laughing about the hypocrisy of his state, uh, of, of his stature, of his being. Um, you know, that, 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 that clip disgusts me. He disgusts me. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, America disgusts me right now. I love my country. I think I've made that clear. I love the potential of my country, but I'm disgusted by what we've become, that we had such a buffoon in office um, and that we're willing to laugh at him instead of, you know, getting angry about what he said. Um, Two buffoons, actually, Scott. Number sorry. one and the vice buffoon. Mm. The what buffoon? Vice, vice buffoon, the second one. Oh, Cheney? No, I'm talking uh, Kamala. Oh no! Well, now, now I was talking. I thought I thought you were talking about uh, George uh, Bush's. Um, yes, that yeah. that's true. That's true. So the but people, I'm that, are, the people current, that are in power today are, mm -hmm. are 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 a direct product of the corruption of the American political system. Joe Biden had has has never been a viable candidate for president. Kamala Harris couldn't even get one percent of the uh, of the of of, of, the, of the Democratic support during the Democratic primary. And yet now she's vice president. You have, to, you have to ask yourself, how did this come to be? It's because the Democratic National Committee is 100% controlled by corporate interests. Joe Biden is nothing other than an extension of corporate interests. He has been his entire political career. I think we will end this here because, again, we went almost two hours today. And you gave us so much information and so much insight. And... Um, I would like to connect with you again in the near future and check this um, situation with Ukraine. Because I, and also with, you know, that summit that will take place in, in yeah. Spain, as you said. I think those are such important moments in history of, of the planet, of us, all of us. And we see what unfolds after that. So Scott, thank you so, so much again for giving me so much time and um, your energy today. And yeah, so I guess until next time. Okay, well, thanks for having me.